Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the La Lita Loca Cruise Podcast. I am your host, Tony, and really a cool episode for you today. Fresh off of the world's largest cruise ship, Icon of the Seas, we're talking with Matt from RoyalCaribbeanBlog.com, and we uh, cover a lot of topics. We we go deep when it comes to Icon of the Seas, but we also talk about some some real you know timely topics in cruising right now. We talk about why cruise prices are so high. How are the service levels? We talk about whether or not private islands are good for cruising, and we do it all in the context of Royal Caribbean. Look, this guy is a Royal Caribbean expert. This is my source when I'm looking for the latest and greatest on Royal Caribbean. Uh, yeah, Come on in with me. Let's have this conversation with Matt from Royal Caribbean Blog. All right. We are joined here today by Matt from Royal Caribbean Blog. Matt, how the heck are you? Good, Tony. Thanks for having me on here today. Man, thanks so much for taking some time out. Uh, I know you've just come back from a busy week on the world's largest cruise ship, the Icon of the Seas. We're certainly going to get into that. But before we get to what's been most recent, let's go deep into the past. I have, I don't know that I know the answer to this question. How did you get into cruising? What's your cruising origin story? <laughs> I, uh, my, we first started getting into cruising when I was probably a teenager. Uh, my family took me on a Disney cruise. We did like we did a Disney cruise. Um, it was a three night weekend cruise, and we we're like, "Wow, this is really cool." And then we were like, "Well, that's cool because that was we lived. In, I grew up in Connecticut, and the ship, uh, the course Disney goes out of Port Canaveral, and that was great." But then we're like, "Cool, we like cruising. Let's try like more cruising." But there's cruises out of New Jersey, which is a lot closer to Connecticut than Florida, and that's where we tried our first Royal Caribbean cruise on Explorer in the Sea. So the first Disney cruise was in the late '90s, and I think my first Royal cruise on Explorer was. Um, it must have been early 2000s, something like that. It was, it was pretty early on. And that kind of got me hooked on cruising. We kind of went back and forth. Uh, we did, I did some Disney cruises and the Disney became like really expensive. So, um, and, and Oasis of the Seas came out in 2009 and that got like a lot of people's attention. It was like, holy moly, that's a, now that's a cruise ship right there. And we wanted to try it out. And my cruise on Oasis was the impetus for many things, including um, trying real, really moving towards Royal Caribbean more because I kind of not only loved what Oasis had, but I also appreciated more the value and what Royal Caribbean brought to the table compared to Disney and largely I never looked back. Oh, awesome. So you've been loyal to Royal since the Oasis days. Is that a, is that a fair takeaway? Uh, with one, my uh, during college, or no, it wasn't college. It was after college. Um, when I had my first daughter, uh, we went on one NCL cruise out of New York because I thought Tony, maybe I just love cruising. Maybe I just all ships are great, and I have a great time. We went on NCL, I don't know, Gem or Star or something out of New York, which was convenient, um, but it wasn't it didn't it didn't really do it for me like Royal did. So I kind of figured, okay, well, there is actually a distinction between the lines, and uh, maybe I prefer Royal Caribbean more than the others. Uh, well, that's look. When I think of Royal Caribbean cruisers, and when I think of people that talk about Royal Caribbean cruises, you're definitely the person that I think about. Uh, I don't think I know the answer to this question either. Have you been on every cruise ship that's current in the Royal Caribbean fleet? No, I've probably I'm still missing somewhere in the ballpark of I think five or six ships. Uh, certainly, Spectrum of the Seas, the most notable one. That one's over. It's been in Asia since her startup. So that's the newest ship I have not been on. Um, but there's other ones. A lot of the Vision Class ships I've not been on as well. Um, you know, I really, for most of the years that I did Royal Green Blog, it was it, it was not my primary job. So I only had a little bit of vacation time. And so we wanted to make best use of it as possible. Um, and in these days now, uh, I certainly have more opportunities to go on cruises. Um, but we're also opportunistic. We're also looking for what's, you know, uh, cruise with my family, which is always something fun to do. And there's a lot of cool options there. So I'd like to get to every single ship eventually. It's not my like overarching goal to just have that, but it's certainly a, I think like any cruiser, Tony, you, you can't help but not track that in your mind on some level. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, look, I'm definitely not rubbing it in, but I've been on Spectrum of the Seas, so I feel like you know, <laughs> at least at least I'm bringing something to the Royal Caribbean table today. I feel pretty good about that. Uh, that's that's a you know it leads me to this thought process. You've tried some Disney, you've tried uh, NCL, and then most recently you've tried some Celebrity Cruise Line. So we'll talk about that. But what is it about Royal Caribbean that even though you've tried some of these other cruise lines, what what are what are some of the wow factors? For Royal Caribbean that keeps you coming back time after time? I think by far, and this was really exemplified by my cruises on Celebrity, which we had a great time about, but man, the entertainment that Royal Caribbean has on its ships is what really draws me back. I love the variety of entertainment, the variety of things you can do, whether it's activities, shows, singers, all that combined really draws me to a more I enjoy that experience more, and of course, it's a family cruise line, so I can find things that I enjoy. My kids can find things they enjoy. My parents can find things that they enjoy. It's not leaning too heavily in one direction or another. Yeah, it, it makes sense to me. I've I've long said that I feel like Royal has the best entertainment at sea. When you think about your cruising profile, about the things that you love about cruising, is entertainment at the top of your list, or is it a mix of things that you look for when you're when you're going cruising? I certainly, entertainment is a big part of it. I certainly look for, uh, I think, I, I like having latest and greatest. I like having variety, Tony, because, you know, you've been on enough cruises that you know. Some days you feel like doing every single thing in that cruise compass, the you know, list of activities. Some days you just you want to have breakfast and take a nap and then wake up again around the afternoon and just kind of lounge around, right? There isn't always going to be a game plan that's always the same. And that's what I love about Royal is that you have that variety. You're not dependent on you know a one trick pony so to speak in terms of being able to provide that i love that there's so many choices oh no in some cases especially the new newer ships an overwhelming in a good way sense of choices and that just that that brings me back every time do you think it's part of the strategy of the cruise companies to offer more that you can do more than you can do so maybe you come back I, you know the interesting thing is i went through a phase in my cruising career where i just wanted to collect as many different cruise ships as possible i was very strict about okay i'm never going to cruise the same cruise ship twice but now that i live here in florida you you just end up with a lot of opportunities to cruise the same cruise ship twice. Do you think that cruise lines actively go, okay, let's keep in mind that people may cruise the same ship twice and they kind of give you more than you can do in a single cruise? I think there's definitely some truth to that, Tony. I think in general, the industry definitely leans heavily towards attracting the first time cruiser. Um, and of course, that's at the end of the day, that is their main thing. But that being said, whether it's your first time, or it's your fifth time on a given ship, they want to wow you. They want to attract you with like, you won't believe what we have over here on this ship, right? And I don't care if I've been to a particular venue, you know, once or twice before. It's still kind of impressive to see, you know, shows and entertainers and go down certain water slides. It's still fun. So, yes, I agree with what you're saying, that they offer like more than you can chew in a sense to try to, you know, entice you. But I think that works equally for the new cruiser as well as the repeat cruiser. And at the end of the day, you know, it's just like, you know, going to your favorite restaurant, going to your favorite city, going to your favorite sports team. Like, you go there often not necessarily because of the novelty factor, but because you really, really enjoy it and you just want to get more of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, since we're talking about cruise ship entertainment on Royal Caribbean, do you have a show that comes to mind as your favorite all-time Royal Caribbean uh, production show? That's a really good question, because if you had asked me this question like two weeks ago, Tony, I would have given you a different answer, or I might have been, it would have been an easier answer, let's put it that way, because the new Wizard of Oz show on Icon of the Seas is phenomenal. Um, I, my, my, my favorite show that I, I will often say, and it's not going to like win popularity contests by any means, uh, but Columbus the Musical on Harmony of the Seas is a kitschy little Royal Caribbean production. Um, it's loosely based on uh, Christopher Columbus's long-lost cousin, Marvin, who doesn't exist, um, but <laughs> But it's, it's a fictional show, obviously. It's fun. They use music in a way. I, I, I thought it was just a fun show that incorporated good music, great acting, and a fun set. Uh, but, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the Broadway shows. I mean, we've seen them a number, a number of times. And every, whether it's Mamma Mia, Hairspray, Grease, they're always good to see. Um, we're going on Allure this season. We're recording this episode here, and then in about a week and a half or so, we're going on Allure this season. I've seen Mamma Mia, like, I don't know, seven times now. And you know what? We're seeing it again because it's a great show. We just love the, the music of ABBA. 
My first Royal Caribbean cruise was on Oasis of the Seas in 2018. It was prior to it being refurbished. And that really kind of opened my mind to that cruising can be different across a lot of different cruise lines. And just sitting there and seeing cats, like cats was a big deal when I was graduating high school. Everybody was, I'd, ne I'd never seen the production. And I was like, wow, there's a, like a full Broadway cast on board just dedicated to doing this show. A and there were other production shows. So it really did blow my mind. I, I did, you know, when I went on the Spectrum of the Seas and then when I went on Wonder of the Seas, of course they have this new homegrown uh, show, The Effectors, which, you know, very comic, ba comic book based and they fly drones inside the theater. And it was a divergence from the Broadway show, at least on Wonder. D did, it, did it bother you that you didn't get a Broadway show on Wonder or do you like these uh, kind of homegrown productions like Effectors? Good question. Um, I generally prefer the Broadway shows. My biggest thing, and I love Royal Caribbean, but I my biggest gripe with shows in general are shows with no plot. Uh, maybe this is because I do cruise way too much, and this is, <laughs> but you know I've seen so many shows that have no plot, and it's like okay, well I can appreciate you know music and 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 performances and that aspect of it, but I really like having a plot. I like being able to connect to the story being told and being able to say, ah, here's the protagonist and here's the antagonist. And Effectors One has a very loose story to it. <laughs> Effectors 2 is the exact same story to it, rehashed uh, again, yeah. and it's it's very loose. It's I don't hate it. I mean, I certainly prefer shows that have a plot. And again, Wizard of Oz and Icon is a great example of that, because that has a definite plot to it. So I certainly lean more in those directions, and to answer your question more directly, Tony, yeah, if I had the choice, I would much rather have a Broadway show, not only because it's tried and true, but also because it has a great story to it as well. Just because I'm unfamiliar, so is the Wizard of Oz production on Icon? Is that a port from? Is that a port of a Broadway show, or is that something that was developed uh, around the Wizard of Oz for for Icon? It's uh, it's not the musical. I thought initially it was based on the musical. There was a very short lived Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, mm -hmm. Wizard of Oz, which and Royal Caribbean has a long history with Andrew Lloyd Webber. It's like, oh, this must be it. It's not. So it's, it's just an original production based on the movie. Um, so it's more akin to the movie than it is the musical. It's not related to the musical at all. So it's more closer to the movie, if you will. I like that. I mean, I, you know, to me, I, I think I like that maybe a little better than Effectors. Effectors is just some, you know, unknown thing. And uh, to your point that the Wonder Show is a rinse and repeat. Effectors 2 is a rinse and repeat of Effectors 1. But it, it's good to see. I tell you, one of the things I'm most excited about when I cruise Icon, of course, I'm not scheduled to cruise Icon, but that that show. And then, of course, anytime I can see a new Aqua show, I'm very much excited about that. I think that's those Aqua shows are so groundbreaking in yeah. cruising. There's nothing, nothing else like it. Uh, you know, we're kind of talking around it a little bit, or it's lying there under the surface. The reason that you can see on one cruise, an uh, ice skating show, an aqua show, a Broadway show, dueling pianos, a, a variety, uh, you know, a dedicated comedy space, is because Royal Caribbean, they, they make small and medium-sized cruise ships, but they make big, mega cruise ships. And, you know, if you follow along the industry and you follow along not only the industry side but the customer base side of it there's it seems like there's a healthy debate whether or not uh, a mega cruise ship is good or bad for cruising i always argue it's good for cruising because you get all of these more opportunities but you've been cruising a lot longer than i have and you've seen the evolution of the big cruise ship do you think that this is i think the answer is obvious but do you think that the the advent of the mega cruise ship has that been good for cruising or are there some aspects of it that may not be good for cruising I think there's pros and cons to everything, but by and large, the mega cruise ship has been great for cruising. It captures the the public's imagination. It draws more people into cruising. I think for those reasons alone, it's been good for the industry as a whole. Cruising, in generally speaking, the cruise industry, I feel, um, is very much, it grows by people trying out one aspect of it, and then they find their niche that they particularly love. In a lot of cases, it's going to be the mega line, the mainstream lines are out there that have the mega ships, you know, Royal Caribbean Carnival Norwegian. Some people come into one of those lines and then discover, well, I really like more of an intimate experience. Maybe I like Celebrity or Princess better. Or maybe they go all the way and they're like, oh, no, I only like, you know, exploration cruises or expedition ships or, you know, uh, luxury ships, right? But 
the, it, the 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 metaphor, you know, rising tides lift all boats, is very much true of, um, of of cruising. I remember when Virgin Voyages came out, and Royal Caribbean was having, I think they were having an earnings call, I think, and someone asked, one of the analysts asked Royal Caribbean, said, "Yeah, what do you think about this new upstart competitor? You know, are you upset about them or something to that effect?" And Richard Fain, who was at the time the chairman of Royal Caribbean Group, said, "No, we welcome this. Are you kidding? It's great news because a new player in the arena brings in." Attention that didn't exist before, and that will eventually lead some people, inevitably, that are going to try Virgin to come over to our Royal Caribbean and vice versa. And it, it, it's good for the entire industry. So I think it's been great. I mean, you can make, you can point out things you know you don't like about the mega ships and deficiencies of that, and I, you can do that about every line, every ship of every size. Um, but I think in general, Tony, I really believe that it has. Um, I feel like the, the mega ships push the boundaries. And the rest of the industry follows there within. So the innovations, things that come with the big ships, eventually make their way onto the smaller ships, and the entire industry benefits from it uh, in total. The interesting thing, as you bring up Virgin Voyages, and I know many of us watched it as they were coming into the space. Would they be disruptive? Would they push cruising forward? The one thing that I did, you know, that I do enjoy seeing in cruising is uh, I think businesses are smart to analyze what you know other companies are doing and to take some of the best of what the other companies are doing. And, and it is really interesting. You can see that, like in the new Icon, uh, you know, they they tested out the infinite veranda. The, you know the the fake balcony from Celebrity, and now that's on the Icon. Uh, I just came off of the newest Carnival cruise ship, the Jubilee, and a lot of the concepts that you have on Jubilee around multi space. I would definitely attribute that to what Royal Caribbean has done. You can see tastes of Virgin Voyages here and there now on new cruise ships. So I think it's a it's a really neat symbiotic thing that happens in cruising, and uh, I think Royal pushes and drives that quite a bit. Uh, I know you you know you jumped out. Of of your consistent going on Royal Caribbean to try Celebrity, I think it was last year, late last year. What was the motivator for that? Was it was it maybe driven by some of the content that you create, or was it just like you just wanted to try something else, or did they ask you to come check it out? How, how did that work out? Uh, it was a little column A, column B. Um, we One thing on Royal Caribbean blog is I wanted to start covering Celebrity more, so that was one aspect of the rationale. The other one was, um, as our family, we were, we were really interested in trying it out. It seemed like a good opportunity. Our kids were getting a little older than I mean they're still you know the oldest has just turned uh, she was 12 at the time of the cruise so we're not talking like you know 20 year olds they're just they're not toddlers anymore um, but we thought maybe it might be something fun to, to try and so I didn't um, you know celebrity didn't you know do anything in terms of inviting me we just booked a cruise on celebrity apex and the the edge class tony really interested me i had seen a lot of videos that have been obviously posted on youtube and, and a lot of content it was just it looked really interesting it looked like a, a, a different kind of experience and i was curious but also because it's celebrity which is a sister brand to royal caribbean i felt like it wasn't too much of stepping out you know it, was, it wasn't like cheating because it's within the family not that that metaphor actually holds up now that i said that out loud but you know what i mean on that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was a great op it was a good opportunity for me to try something different and kind of see how these two lines, one a premium line, one a mainstream line, but still very similar, the, 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 the differences and the similarities between the two. It's kind of funny. I've cruised with people that have been very loyal to a certain brand, and then maybe you go on a different brand with them, and it seems like almost immediately uh, there, there's a vocalization of the differences. Did that happen with your family? Like, did your did your child that loves pizza or you that love pizza, was there a moment where you're like, hey, where's the Sorrentos at on this play? What's going on? Did you have some of those yeah. moments? We uh, we were something similar to that. We were in before the celebrity, our celebrity cruise. We were in port in Saint somewhere um, with a celebrity edge class. I don't know if it was Apex. It might have been another one. It doesn't matter. But we're, we're docked right next to it. And uh, my kids are there. They're like, oh, there's the ship we're going to go on in for Thanksgiving. And my kids saw them. And obviously, celebrity ships are not as large as Royal Caribbean. And, but they're still not like small ships. I mean, they're decent sized. And my oldest daughter was like, we're going on that small ship? Like, she was, like, beyond, her, beyond like, upset that we were going on a small ship. I'm like, there's still plenty to do on there. It's not, you know, we're not taking you on 
I don't know, some expedition ship. But but that was like one of the first times, Tony, where where it was like culture shock for Royal Caribbean people. So it, it definitely it definitely sounds like that uh, family is a big part of why you cruise and you cruise all together as a family. Do you have any aspirations of going on some uh, kind of more luxury lines? <laughs> maybe as your family gets older, or maybe if you cruise just with your wife, like a, like what would it be? Would it be like an Oceana? Or are there any of those brands that that kind of get you excited to try? Um, I think maybe Silver Sea. Obviously, again, another Royal Caribbean brand, so that's a natural fit. I I think at this point, I'm not. I, I, I would admit that I'm not painting myself in any corners, that I can't try things. Um, I think that the answer to your question is almost inevitably yes. I just don't know like, if that's in three years or ten years from now. No, no clue. Um, but I've, I've said at this point that part of what I want to do is be able to, in, in, in talking about Royal Caribbean, understanding where Royal Caribbean is as a brand, is you have to understand what other lines are doing and then being able to pick up on trends and comparisons, things of that nature. Um, so I would definitely say, yes, at some point I'd like to, I don't know which one it might be, um, but it would be really cool, especially in certain markets like the Caribbean. I'm not really sure there's much of a difference um, in terms of the itineraries, but certain ports where, you know, like Alaska is a great example, because in some places, you know, you'll dock, like it seems like eons away and the small, smaller ship gets to go really close. And I always thought, That'd be nice if I was that guy instead of over here. But so maybe that's the impetus down the line. It's interesting, and I, I think it's a standard question that everybody gets answered. And sometimes when I'm answering it myself, I'm like, "Yeah, of course I want to go on." The, but then I don't. I, I probably I I don't think there's anything wrong with just liking what you like, right? Like so now because yeah. I've tried I've tried a lot, and then I'm like, man, maybe it's okay just to like what you like. So, but you know, it's like then there's always this wonder in your mind. Okay, what's that thing like over there? Right. Uh, I, I don't know. You, you talk about you know the strategy of Royal Caribbean, and you have a lot of insight on this, and maybe uh, definitely more than I do. D- does it feel like that Royal Caribbean? Do you think that their prices are? It seems like cruising is expensive right now. It seems like Royal's prices are more elevated than I've ever seen previously. Do you think all of that is market driven, or do you think there is a strategy to maybe push those prices up to a to a level of tolerance that you know they can get without you know turning too many people off. What do you think about the state of, you know, pricing right now? Some of these icon prices are just more than I've ever seen anything else, uh, even on luxury cruises. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not wrong in your observations. It's definitely the case. I think it's a combination of the market and that they can, they can get those prices, I think. And they've said as much during their, um, their, their, in financial statements when they talk about their, with their earnings calls and whatnot, that they are looking to maximize their value. Um, this is partly, because, of course, uh, during the pandemic, they accrued so much debt, they're trying to get out of that. But I think this is, they're a for-profit company. This is something that I happen to often remind myself about. I love Royal Caribbean. I'm a big Royal Caribbean fan, but they are a for-profit company. This is not a charity. And um, the pricing, I mean, first of all, like everything in life has gone up in prices over the last couple of years. Some things more than others, obviously. Um, and I th- still think that there's value in there. And I think Royal is trying to find that balance of it. Um, you know, we've seen certain things where they put the price up and then they actually brought it back down because they realized the market wasn't going to bear that. Uh, there are two examples I can think of. One is the Hideaway Beach, which is the new expansion of Perfect Day. And the other one is the Crown's Edge, which they also slashed the price of that almost immediately once they kind of saw that wasn't going there. But I mean, at the end of the day, for cruise pricing, I mean, the, the ships are selling like hotcakes. I mean, they're just, there's so much demand that I don't fault them for doing it. I don't like it, but I don't fault them because what are they supposed to do? I mean, this, this, isn't, a, this isn't rent control. It's not supposed to be something that, you know, you, I, I, don't, I don't want them to ever go up to like some sort of a luxury brand because they're not that. But I think they're trying to figure out where is that space where they can command a certain premium price for it and then get that. Um, So it's been part of their playbook for a while. We've just seen, I think it's a combination of, first of all, the market, just like, again, pricing just going crazy. And then also we had that period between 2020 and 2022 where prices have gone down a lot. Like during the pandemic, I know you were like me, you were booking up cruises like crazy because they was like dirt cheap. So it kind of arbitrarily reset pricing a little bit. Kind of, there were like, there's a larger gap than if we had gone from 2019 to 2023 without much in the middle, if that makes sense. Um, I feel like that's also contributing a little bit to it. But no, you're not wrong. The prices are definitely higher. 
Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's hard to be mad, right? Like, you, you got to make hay when the sun is high, right? That's, you know, you, you know, because you, you don't know, uh, you know, nobody could have really predicted the global pandemic and the shutdown and all that debt that was incurred by all of these cruise companies. I, I find another interesting thing that I, you know, again, the prices are high. The market is dictating that. The demand curve is certainly there. I can't remember what, you know, I, I, most of the major cruise companies have said they're, they're anywhere between 70 and 80 percent already booked for all of 2024, which is incredible. Uh, but the other thing that I've seen happening, right, when you have this massive amount of debt, you can tackle that debt by increasing revenue through raising your prices. You can also tackle that debt by uh, working on your operational costs. And sometimes operational costs are improved by reducing services to passengers on board. One famously is, you know, going from two times of a touch on a, you know, a cab in a day, a, you know, cleaning and a turn down to yeah. just a single. We've seen several cruise lines do that. We've seen several cruise lines say, okay, you used to be able to eat 85 lobsters, but now you can't do that anymore. There's an additional charge. But wh what do you see as you've looked at the cruise industry's evolution since the return to cruising? Are, are you seeing, do you feel like the service is uh, mildly different, drastically different? Do you see that, that that's a lever that they're pulling to work on their operational cost? I think there's some things to that. Um, the housekeeping one is the biggest one. That's by far one thing that I notice the most. And it's um, with Royal Caribbean, you only get, if you're staying in a um, balcony or below, so not a suite, you get just once a day service instead of two times. And that's like, you can't sugarcoat that. That's a cutback. It's, it's the very definition of that. The rest of the changes that I have seen have, in my opinion, have not really cut on the core experience of the cruising. Um, in a lot of cases, it's like littler things that were more tangential and certainly might have been nice to have. But I feel like in the case of Royal Caribbean, I can't speak for the entire industry, but I feel like in the case of Royal Caribbean, most of the cuts and the changes that they had done, especially as they returned to service and they realized they needed, again, bring some of those operational costs down have been largely more of the things that have not directly affected me. Like they haven't touched, I think the, the third rail or the golden calves that exist within cruising that really change much. Um, it, but that's, that's my opinion. I know other people definitely differ on that, but I feel like the cuts have been more to be more efficient with what they're doing rather than, I don't want to say opulent. That's not the right word, but rather than just, you know, letting the, the excess, kind of grow, um, they, they definitely move in that direction to help cut some of that stuff back. So, you know, operationally reducing costs, raising prices, this is, you know, like, as you said, Tony, that's exactly what they're trying to do here. They're trying to cut back on that debt. I mean, in the last, in the fourth quarter, they paid back, I believe, three billion with a B dollars of debt back, and they, they made a profit still of zero point three billion dollars. So that's what three hundred million dollars, right? That's not bad. On I don't know what the revenue number was, but that's real. That's a lot of money they're paying off, and they still have double digit debt left over there. So this they're they're far from the finish line. But this is as you as you summarized perfectly exactly what they're trying to do. Get to that point where they can be a little more free flowing, a little more. Uh, open. I will admit, though, I'm curious, what happens when we get five, ten years from now when they're not, I don't know if they're debt-free, sometimes debt is not bad, right? But in a position where this debt is not, like, crushing like it is currently, what does that look like? Because I don't think they're bringing back twice a day you know, stateroom attendant. No. I, I just don't see that happening. The, the thing that's interesting to me is as we watch these companies in 2018, 2019, as I became more familiar with these companies, the cruising were like, like I said, it. they, they can print money, right? So they're very profitable businesses. And I still feel like even in today's situation, a better va value than a land-based vacation. I feel like you're getting more bang for your buck. So I think, like you say, five, 10 years from now, they just may be making tons of money and hopefully that money will, you know, not only be used to, you know, uh, shore up the stakeholders and everybody make a big salary and all that, but hopefully they'll continue. And I think they've proven this, that they'll continue to push innovation. It's interesting the play that Royal made to keep their run book of ships full as Carnival pulled back. So uh, I, I think it's going to be a neat thing. And then you touched on it earlier, uh, and I never really thought of it so succinctly. The goal of these cruise companies are to bring in new cruisers. And as we look at the, you know, as we look 
look at the numbers for new cruisers, that number increases by the millions every year. And so the interesting thing to me is that even if you've got a stalwart of veteran experienced cruisers that go, oh, I remember the day when I used to get two room cleanings, the new cruiser, they don't they don't know that. And so yeah. you're, you're building a whole new legacy of what will be seasoned cruisers that, that don't think it's any different. So I guess that's the value prop for anybody that's a seasoned cruiser. Maybe you don't like the service levels or the things that have changed or the new price. Are you going to continue to cruise? And I'm sure some accountant somewhere, uh, you know, inside of these organizations went, well, if we have a five or 10% fall off of loyal older cruisers, we're going to replace that. So it, it's a, I don't know. I, I get fascinated by that whole aspect of it. it. I would love to be a fly on the wall in some of those meetings. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing that there's one other thing when I'm thinking about what feels divergent in cruising right now, it seems like we're seeing an increased play uh, on the private Island. And so you've got more years cruising than I do. Of course, when uh, Coco Key became what it is and it really became the dominant private Island that became, I feel like the standard for others to look at, but it certainly wasn't the first private Island. Uh, can you chart like at least in your cruise experience, what the, what the role, how, how predominant private islands were in the cruise experience for the last 10 years or something? Yeah. I mean, private islands used to be part of the game plan. Like they were like a, a place you could go to and they've been largely, you know, very, very successful. Um, but they were always more just glorified private beaches, right? Your ship would pull in, you go to the beach, have a barbecue lunch and kind of hang out there for the day. And it was nice. And I think, I don't know this for a fact, but my opinion on this is that I think, um, and you've certainly seen this, Tony, where there are certain ports of call that cruise ships go to that consistently get really negative reviews. Passengers come back and say, we had a great time on the cruise, but man, we had such a not great time over in, you know, uh, you know, Nassau, Falmouth, whatever the place may be, right? And cruise lines thrive on guest satisfaction. That's what gets them business. And so I think they saw an opportunity to do, to invest in their own product, create a an area they can control, their private island, but really provide something that really draws people in, that really attracts them over to that. And the the investment went from beyond like, hey, let's get a stretch of beach somewhere and call it our own private beach. Let's now offer more in terms of attractions, entertainment, food, and things to do than we've ever offered, similar to how that cruise ships have evolved from that. Because cruise ships used to be just basically floating hotels that with a pool that you know went around, and now they have a lot more of their destinations in and of themselves. What if we go to this? This provides a place that uh, uh, passengers can go to that they're going to love from a guest satisfaction standpoint, and you know the cruise line is making all the money from start to finish because every single dollar spent on that island is goes right back to them, right? Because it's their it's their private venue. There's no outside third party excursions there. So it, that seemed to have, that was a big bet um, when Royal Caribbean wanted to reinvest in Coco Key and redevelop it. And I think the rest of the industry really jumped on that trend. And now you're seeing so many more lines try to embrace that strategy because it's a money maker and it's a it's a smile maker it makes it makes it makes us happy yeah so the the interesting thing is um and this is completely philosophical and it doesn't really have any bearing in anything i don't think but i think there was always kind of like some higher idea that uh cruising is a way to open up travel to people that don't traditionally travel uh, you know it feels a little bit like if the focus is to put people on a cruise ship in florida and then take them to an island that is completely controlled by the cruise line and then take them back to florida that doesn't really even seem like international travel at all anymore, but I don't think anybody cares, so I don't know why I'm worried about it. So I guess the broad question, <laughs> is cruising real travel, or you know, is this a vacation option that is kind of the best of both worlds, where you can go on a luxury cruise ship with all these amenities and go to a completely you know, uh, contained place and not have to worry about international travel? Do, do, for you and your family, Family, do you have any like, oh, I want to experience the cultural aspects of cruising or does it matter? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, outside of the, the weekend cruise, the three and four hundreders that only go to the Bahamas, like that, those were never cultural immersions to begin with anyway. So we'll just, we'll just side uh, step those for a second. I think in general, 
there is some, I think most people like that idea. And to be fair, if you're going on a longer cruise in three or four nights, you're going somewhere other than their private island. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, obviously, why do you go on a cruise? Because you want to have a good time. It's a vacation, right? In the same way that if you go to New York City, Tony, some people eat at Sabaro and they go to, um, they eat at, um, you know, the, the, the kitschy uh, TGI Fridays and places like that. Like, what are you doing? You're going to New York City and that's where you're eating? Like, there are, and when I say some people, I mean millions of people do that, right? This isn't like, yeah. you know, four or five. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad vacation. It's what they want to do. It's what they enjoy. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, not every trip needs to be this, like, you know, global trek in which you're in, like, this undeveloped area, uh, you know, discovering a new tribe or, 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 I don't know, embracing a brand new culture to you. I think you can get degrees of that by visiting these places. And I think that cruising brings you to some of the other fo the other places in the world that, uh, excuse me, offer something that are more than, you know, just sitting by the beach. But for a lot of people, especially in the Caribbean, sitting by the beach is like the number one reason people go on a cruise. They enjoy that experience there. And we shouldn't shame that. I mean, it's still somewhere different. They're still getting out there. They're probably getting a passport. And if you buy a passport, that's going to open up a whole world of travel for you as an investment in your travel career. Um, it's... Really, cruising is a gateway drug for, for travel in general. And, and if you're, you know, it doesn't, just because you're at Coco Key doesn't mean that you're not necessarily going to want more of it and want to experience more of it. I think a lot of cruisers start out with Caribbean cruises and end up like, well, I'd really like to go to Europe because I saw Tony post a video that he was out there and he went on Spectrum of the season. Matt didn't go there, so I want to check that out myself. Like, that, it, it, it breeds the, the interest more than, than anything. So I'm going to lose points because when I went to Japan, I did eat at a McDonald's when I was on Spectrum. <laughs> Steve. But I also ate at a authentic sushi place, too. But I wanted to know what McDonald's in, in Japan was sure. like. Uh, but what you just described was exactly my circumstance. Uh, we just cruised to the Caribbean a few times, and I went, wow, this is the cruising makes it really viable. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll go to China. That was like my big leap. I'd never been off the continent before, and the very first trip I took, I, I went to China and got on yeah. a ship and went to Japan. So uh, for me, cruising was that gateway, and I think maybe that's why I'm protective of it. Like I said, it's really a throwaway idea that, you know, everybody cruises for their own reason, that kind of thing. But but talking about the special destinations, you know, beyond just sitting on a beach somewhere, uh, what are some of your favorite places that you've visited beyond the beach? And do you have any places that you aspire to go to? Oh, certainly. Uh, in Europe, well, I did my first European cruise last year, and that was eye-opening on many levels, and I love that. Um, and we're doing that uh, in 2025 with the family, so that'll be great. But Alaska's always been the place, Tony, where I can go there, like, every time. I mean, it's like you think, like, oh, see the glaciers, all right, that's, like, you know, done, that's it. But, man, I love Alaska. Um, it's not also because it's a great escape from Florida summer, but I, I really enjoy the, the, the majesty of it, the beauty of the area. It is a phenomenal place to go to, and if I could, uh, I would love to go there every year. But the aspirational place, I mean, more of Europe. I've only done one European cruise. I definitely want to do that. And then, I mean, I would like to do, obviously, an, an Australia and an Asian cruise, especially Asia, going to Japan. That looks amazing. I've seen what you've done. I've seen what Sherry from Cruise Tips TV has done over there. And that looks absolutely amazing. I have a deep flying phobia. Uh, I, I'm mm. going to get over it at some point, but um, I would love to do that because I think that would be a, um, a just an incredible experience. Because if I liked Alaska, but more Europe, I think I'm going to love those places as well. I, I think I think you would. It, it was uh, it, it really opened opened my mind a lot. And I think did you just do Canada last year for the first time the, yep. up the East Coast? That's I like that itinerary too. So I think we're very similar. Uh, I, I could go to Alaska every year. I went to Europe for the first time last year. We're going back. We, we kind of, I don't know that we cheated the system, but my wife doesn't go on some of these longer trips because she doesn't particularly like to fly, but we figured out a way to take a transatlantic to Barcelona. Then we're going to do a cruise, you know, on MSC around the med. Then we're yep. going to hang out in Barcelona for five days and do a transatlantic back. So we're going to get her over and back without an airplane flight, which is exciting, but I'm very content to try another cruise ship up the East coast, up into Canada. I thought that was a great itinerary. So yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten that you went and I think we hit some of the same ports in the, in the, in Europe last year, which, uh, it, it does open. It does definitely.
definitely open your mind. All right, let's uh, let's transition and let's talk about the uh, the big cruise ship in the room, Icon of the Seas. You just came off of one week sailing of Icon. You were able to do a sneak peek. I think you were on the so you probably had what like close to ten days, you know, all together with Icon right now. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so, I did a did a three night cruise and a seven night inaugural cruise. There you go. Ten days on Icon. And uh, I know that, and, you know, I'm not completely astute with the history. Oasis was a game changer. And then there was another ship before that was really a game changer. Was that Freedom or something like that? Like, what was what was the big ship before Oasis? Uh, Voyager of the Seas. Because that Voyager. was the one that introduced the Promenade and the first real, uh, a big, big ship in quite a long time. And so that promenade is definitely a concept that's been built on since then. And now we come to Icon of the Seas, which everything that I've watched does look like they've tried to take the best of Oasis class and rearrange it in a way and come up with a whole new concept. Do you think this was a big leap for Royal Caribbean or do you feel like it's just an iterative jump? Just Do you feel like it's just a rearrangement of Oasis or do you think they've like they've done something drastically new? I think they've done something drastically new. It reminds me a lot of, uh, I'm going to geek out here, Star Trek The Next Generation. Because Star Trek The Next Generation on the surface is Star Trek, but with a different cast, right? But mm. if you've watched both shows and you know it's a drastically different approach and things have been fleshed out a lot more. And with Icon, uh, that is definitely the case. I remember, you know, you and I, Tony, we cover the we, we cover the daily stuff that happens, right? So, like, you know, you remember when I, Royal Caribbean announced, you know, a certain feature here and a certain feature there. And individually... You know, very few, they all kind of like, like, okay, whatever, like, okay, that's cool, but like, nothing is like, wow, I can't believe that, right? But together, the sum of the parts, when you get on board Icon, I was blown away by it. I, I was not prepared for how all these little things working together really reinvented. I think the, the cruise ship experience. You have to, you have things that have already existed. Central Park is on there. Uh, you have an aqua theater. Those are features that have been on ships before, but they are the next evolution of that. Then you have new features on there, right? And you have different areas that have never been seen before. And you put all that together, and I was really blown away by the flow, by the experience, how they could take their best ideas, put them all into one, and to prove that i'm going on alert the seas as i mentioned in a little bit and i'm not, I'm not regretting it i'm not disappointed to go on alert but when i was getting off icon i was like oh, man they're not gonna have destination elevators they're not gonna have a royal promenade that's as open as this they're not gonna have like all those little things together like it really it it, it changes your perspective on cruising and remember um voyager this is funny you bring that up tony voyager introduced the rock climbing wall. Now, like, I think every every Royal Caribbean cruise ship has a rock climbing wall now. I don't know about other lines, but, like, in 1999, guys, that was a big deal, a rock climbing wall, right? And now we take it for granted because, like, every line and their mother has one. But that was a big change then. Here again, we have new, uh, uh, new features, new amenities. Um, I, I was really the, – the total experience – Having come away, especially on that seven night cruise, it really impressed me, Tony. Yeah, there's so many things that I've seen in the footage coming out of there that just tweak my interest. You mentioned the destination elevators, and I've never called them that before. But the first time that I heard you call them that, this is what I'm this I'm I'm helping spread that that word destination elevators. Uh, I've seen it in play in hotels before. I've seen it in play on Carnival cruise ships before. How well did people adapt to the destination elevators? It, it actually much faster than I thought. They actually Royal Caribbean put crew members in all the elevator lobbies because they were anticipating some problems. People got it right away. I think the biggest thing is when you when you do that and you push the button or the panel for which floor you want to go to. Instinctively, when you get in the elevator, you turn around and immediately look at the panel. And be like, oh no, wait, I don't have to do anything. That, like that's the only like stumbling block if you want to call it that. Um, but I was I thought for sure there'd be people getting on elevators like randomly and be like, no, 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 you have to go push the panel out there. It never happened once on the inaugural sailing. Um, and, and I think it's it's new for a lot of people too, but they it was more intuitive than I anticipated. And I think they made one change. I know some other lines or hotels have this, the Royal Caribbean doesn't have it. Um, one is you don't have to type in how many people are on your going in the elevator. So you just if you're going to floor four, you just hit four. It doesn't matter. You can't like hit it like four times for four people. It okay. doesn't matter. I asked Rill about that because I was like, hey, aren't you worried about like 17 people trying to fit on an elevator? And they said, I mean, it's a possibility of it happening, but it's unlikely in the grand scheme of things. Also, the elevators are limited at, as of right now anyway to about three floors or so at a time that they can be accommodating. So you don't 
the, the chances of that scenario playing out are lessened, if you will. It is funny. That is a point of contention I've seen on Carnival. Uh, some people are real adamant, like, you got to hit that thing four times. And I've seen people get upset about it. So it's interesting that they've just said, look, uh, it'll work out. So that, that's pretty cool. And then the other thing I noticed there on the Royal Promenade is escalators. And maybe it's only one set of escalators going down to the casino. But I think that's the first time I've ever seen escalators on a cruise ship. And I, I liked it. So, look, I'm, you know, I, I'm a little um, contrary. <laughs> And some you'll talk to people that'll be like, look, I climb every flight of stairs if it's 19 or 20 stairs and I'm I'm of the ilk. And, you know, it's I'm, you know, I could climb stairs. I'm heavy, that kind of thing. But I'm of the ilk that like, why am I climbing stairs on vacation? Like, I, you know, I don't go on any other vacation to climb stairs. So I do like this idea that I saw those escalators. Was it just the one set? There's actually two sets. The one set it always goes down to the casino, but there's another set that they can use when it when the gangway is open and then you go from the casino that floor uh, down another set of escalators to the uh, to the gangway. Did it seem like those were used a lot? It seems like that would facilitate a lot of people movement. Yeah, I mean, I think most people were going to the casino from there. Um, in, in fact, the stairs in general, the flow of Icon can't be understated well enough. Between decks four and seven, you can really get between those decks very easily without ever getting walking all the way to a elevator bank or a staircase that's usually at the opposite ends of the deck. They added different staircases and escalators and even a slide to get between those decks, and that really yeah. helps move people around um, more so than I ever thought possible. I think that's smart. Of course, the the big you know piece in the middle of the promenade is the pearl, and I feel like that's probably you know for the gram, right? Like it's a good place to take a picture. That kind of thing. <laughs> what what I find amazing is behind the pearl, and the thing that I really appreciate as an innovation. Uh, one of the complaints I've always heard levied against the Oasis class is you don't have a lot of natural sunlight in that promenade. That makes it feel like a mall. You don't see. You don't know that you're on a cruise ship. I've heard all those complaints. I really think that's addressed well with that big wall of glass allowing natural sunlight into the cruise ship. What was it like to have the Royal Promenade flooded with natural sunlight? I mean, it, I, again, it's something that if we had this conversation three weeks ago, I'd be like, yeah, that, that seems like a nice change. I was really impressed. So not just the, not just the natural light and the fact that you have light now throughout the promenade, but also how wide it was because they knocked out the cabins. They used to have promenade-facing cabins, and that would constrict the width of the promenade. So getting rid of those and bumping out the promenade from one side of the ship to the other side of the ship, I mean, again, it's a subtle thing. You're not going to write an article or do a YouTube video about, you guys won't believe how, like, that doesn't do it and nobody cares. But in function, it's really cool to see that, and it made such a big difference. And I think it just it, it, it transformed the space. Again, Royal Promenade. Not something that's not a new concept, but it's a new implementation. You've got the windows. You have a wider stance. You have two stories to it as opposed to just, you know, traditionally one or the Esplanade, which has like half a story to it. It's not quite the same thing. Anyway, wide open, lots of space, lots of windows. Um, they, they just they really figured that part out and that and, and the proof is in the pudding there. Hmm. Yeah, it, it looks spectacular. Another thing that's in the Royal Promenade that's new to Royal that I'm very excited about was the Dueling Pianos bar. Did you did you get to experience that? How was that implementation? Yeah, I did it at least three or four times. That just tells you. I mean, the first time was a test. The other three, two or three were definitely because I wanted to go back. I loved it. I'm not like I love the schooner bar. I'm not like the world's biggest schooner bar. Like I'm not a big piano player in general. That's not my shtick. I tend to go down to the pub and enjoy the guitar player that's over there. But I will say, dueling pianos, the the presentation there, and I I think last time Tony I was at a dueling piano bar was like Cowl at the Moon and Spring Break in College. So like it had been a while since I had done that. Um, but I. I really loved it. I thought it was really fun, good energy, a good way to take a concept, you know, just playing piano music to songs you already know, and making it far more interesting. I mean, the place was packed, dude. you got to get there at least half an hour before showtime if you want to get a seat. Otherwise, you're not getting a seat. And it was like, you know, some of the shows, they were, they were like two or three deep people outside the venue wow. just trying to get a, you know, trying to listen to it. It was, it was incredible. Yeah, the, the so many things is going through my mind when it comes to Oasis versus Icon. I love the Aqua Theater and I love the Aqua shows. And I know that some of the challenge with having that outside on the you know on the back of the cruise ship that sometimes the weather can be a problem and the motion of the ocean can be a problem. Uh, how transformative was moving it into its own sphere? Is that that from what I can see that looks uh, amazing? Is that is is it really amazing? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful space. I mean, the Aqua Shows in general are always incredible. You know, the one thing is they, so they solve for one problem, but they kind of, I don't want to say they create another problem for themselves, but they certainly haven't fixed the other problem. So the wind is no longer an issue. So that's good. You don't worry about your shows being canceled because of wind. But um, the theater is located all the way on the top on the front of the ship. That's like one of the worst places for <laughs> movement. movement. Yeah. yeah. So I would argue that that has not been fixed. So it's not to say that it's now cancel proof by any means, but I would argue also that if they had movement and, you know, if the ship is experiencing movement, it's not like on the bottom deck you'd have no movement on and the top would be like, you know, back and forth. It's usually just, you know, degrees of, of magnitude difference. And so that's still an issue there. But I will say, number one, you, have, you don't have to worry about being wet, hot, humid, cold, rainy, like that, that's all solved for. And that alone is worthwhile because I've been on the aqua theater many a time on a, on an Oasis class ship outside in the summer, already sweating because the humidity is a thousand percent and I'm waiting to see the show. Um, it's just nice to be able to do anything. I'm, I'm a firm believer that all things are possible, Tony, with air conditioning. Yes, I, I would agree. <laughs> uh, of course, we haven't needed it in Florida for a few months, which is getting to be disturbing. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's like I could use a little, little bit warmer down here. But uh, so, how many people were on? I'm sure there's more on the inaugural sailing than the, the three day sailing. How full was the ship last week? On the inaugural sailing, we were, depending on which crew member you asked, somewhere around 5,300, 5,500 passengers, which is right at the double occupancy uh, limit, if you will. How, how crowded did it feel? It wasn't crowded at all. That was one of the really, really weird things. Like, like, at, like on night one and two, we were like, where is everyone? Like, where's the crowds? Like on, on the second sea day or third sea day, I specifically went to go find crowds. Like I was like, I'm just gonna go find a crowd. And the, it wasn't on the pool deck. Um, I, the only two places I found, um, a crowd, the adults only pool was crowded, um, because of the adults only pool. And then the swim and tonic bar specifically, which has a swim up bar that you can go to, but like in the regular pool area, I mean, there were sections of chairs that were completely open at like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Like usually prime time prom. I mean, they, they, between all the activities, all the things you can do with your eating, seeing a show, going to a place like dueling pianos, uh, going, doing trivia, um, going to the pool. Like there's so many things happening at once that it has successfully drawn people away that you just don't see the kind of crowd, even on the, even on the real promenade on embarkation day, which is usually the most crowded time you're ever going to find on a cruise ship. Um, and it really wasn't bad at all. Now, granted, you're right. Uh, someone's are yelling at their phone. Well, it wasn't max occupancy, right? In the sense that the ship can handle 7,300, I think, uh, passengers. That's, Assuming you pack in every third and fourth passenger, right? Um, which is basically going to be kids, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, and that's fair. And we're going back on the cruise ship in June to check it out. But I've been on plenty of ships that have 5,000 passengers on there. And it is not, it's never felt remotely that empty on it. So I'm very curious to see how that flows. But so far... Um, it was far less crowded than I expected it to be. Yeah, that's another benefit, I think, of the big ship. I've always felt like Oasis-class ships do a nice job of uh, crowd management. Uh, I've been on many of those ships, you know, close to full capacity, and it, it hasn't felt as crowded as maybe some smaller ships that I've been on that have led. Like, I, I don't know if there's an official metric for public space per passenger, but I feel like the big ships, they've got to have more public space per passenger than some of these smaller ships. Uh, I had a conversation with Derek from Island Time, another content creator last week. He was on the Icon and he talked about uh, a phenomenon. I want to see if you can relate to it. Uh, you know, on the Oasis class cruise ships, you've got the kiddie pool somewhat close to the main pool and all those main pools are there together. But his observation was that they've really designed two kid areas and kids are pretty much in those areas, leaving the main pool almost kid free. Yeah. Did they pull that off? Is that is that actually happening? When when everybody's up on the pool deck, I mean on one of my crew on my one cruise and of course the preview cruise, but there were mostly travel agents there, so that's not really indicative of anything. But yeah, on the cruise I was on, absolutely. I mean, basically the kids were either in Surfside, which is the kids' neighborhood, or they were at Thrill Island in the water park. The only kids in the regular pools, whether it was the Cove Pool, Royal Bay, what have you, were just because I don't know they wanted to go like swimming, like in the traditional sense, like they just wanted to, or their parents they wanted to take them to one of those other places. And they're like, you're going here, um, but it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, the proof was in the pudding there. It, they've really, you know, I was thinking about this, like, why is this fundamentally different? Well, one thing, there's no water, there's no kids pool, water park, whatever, near the main pool. And that means there's more space now 
on the pool deck for for other pools there. Um, it, it's it, it, just, it can't be a coincidence. It's just it seems like they've they've certainly drawn them. And I'm saying that the adult the entire pool deck feels like an adults only pool area. It doesn't. There are still kids there, but far fewer than I think you're normally going to see on pretty much um, you know any other Royal Caribbean ship for that matter. Yeah, I think I think that's a. The more I've thought about that, that's that's a, that's a little bit of a stroke of genius. I think. Uh, also, the you know the other feature that that's gotten a lot of press and a lot of visibility is the infinity suspended pool on the aft of the ship. Everything that I've seen in video, I haven't seen it in person. It looks a little small. Is does that feel more gimmicky than functional, or is that a, that's a pay to play, right? Those those uh, those beds there. Or what, what do you think about that area? Yeah, that's the adults-only area. Um, what I like about it, first of all, before in the week before Icon launched, they made the decision to change that to become the adults-only area. Before that, it was Cloud 17. That's now just general public. Um, mm. I thought that was a better choice for the area. I think the hideaway, which is, the hideaway was going to inevitably or naturally be more of an adults-only area. Like, why would the pool's cool? But I'm not sure like it would draw that many kids there. Um, it's certainly popular. I mean, adults-only pools are popular on some roller coaster cruise ships, especially the. Oasis class one. Some of their pools are extremely small to begin with. The adults only area, at least on Royal Caribbean and a traditional solarium, is usually just having an enclave. Like people like more often than not, people just like lounging in the chairs there than actually in a pool, perhaps, if that makes sense. Um, the yeah. one thing I, w- I do wish they had was more shade, but that's because I'm not a sun worshiper. Um, yeah, yeah. I, and, and there's plenty of people who are definitely enjoy being out in the sun and what have you. But um, I do think the space is nice. I mean, the pool is going to, I mean, pool, cruise ships pools in general are only going to be able to be so large. They're never going to be like, you know, you're going to find on land. So, um, you know, and, and I think to some extent there's some truth to what you're saying, Tony, in terms of it, you know, being a bit of a gimmick. But at the same time, I feel like it does serve the purpose of offering a pretty cool place for adults rather than what I thought was Cloud 17, which was just going to be like a pool on the side of the ship that was near the smoking section. Like, I feel like this is more of a destination. And the fact that it's crowded there, I think, proves that it's, it's popular. Well, talking about adults only, and this uh, kind of goes beyond the icon, but they kind of rolled out at the same time. You have the new adults only area on Coco Key. Uh, I know you got to visit that. What, what do you think of that area? I was blown away by it, Tony. I'm I was never I'm never a big adults only thing like that was never my draw. Of course, I have kids, so there's that as well. But um, I will say that I went into it thinking, oh, this is the adults only area. In fact, it's it is Royal Caribbean's best ideas all in one, and it just happens to be an adults only area. Um, I, I couldn't believe the scale of how big Hideaway Beach is because there's a massive beach, there's a massive swimming pool, amazing cabanas, great food. And um, the pricing, as I mentioned earlier in, in this episode, you know, has come down a little bit. Like for my Wonder of the Seas Spring Break Cruise, it's coming up in a couple months now, the price, and it's a sale obviously right now, it's nineteen ninety nine a person. For nineteen ninety nine, like that is like that's like kids, you're sitting on board the ship, mom and dad are going to the we're going to the pool. Like that's incredibly good value. Um, and it's, it's, I loved, it basically took all the best features. It took the swim up bar from Oasis Lagoon, it took the food from Snack Shack. It took the beach from Coco Beach Club and the cabanas from that have been popular around there, put it all into one area, created a new space. It's adults only, granted, but I, I, I was really, really impressed by what this offers. And it's just like now this is like my de facto go to first choice. And if my kids are with me or we, I can't convince my wife that we should leave our kids behind on the ship, then the next thing is obviously we're going to uh, go somewhere else. But I, I had a, such a great time there, Tony. I was, uh, it was, it really impressed me on many different levels. So we talked about it earlier. You really enjoyed the what they've done with the production show there, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, I don't know that I got your opinion on the Infinite Veranda. I feel like I saw a video from you recently talking about it being controversial. What, what do you think about do, – do you like the Infinite Veranda? You don't like the Infinite Veranda? I generally don't like it. Um, I like the fact that you get the living space back. If you have the veranda closed, then essentially you have a bigger room, which is nice. and that, That's undeniable, and I like that. But why do you book a balcony cabin in the first place? Because you want to have that outdoor space. And it's not a balcony, it's a window. And um, if it's the, the, the problem is when the windows open, especially during the warmer months of the year, the humidity, the air conditioning gets sucked out of the window almost immediately. The humidity comes in and you can't have the air conditioning on at the same time. So you have a very hot room along with your balcony or what a balcony in air quotes here. And that 
doesn't doesn't sit well with me. Um, and so I'm not a giant fan. I do appreciate that Royal did not do what Celebrity did and only have infinite verandas, balconies, whatever you want to call them. They have both, so that's the good news. Um, but I stayed in an infinite veranda on my Icon of the Seas cruise. It was actually a grand suite with that. And it was... Uh, it's January, so actually having the window open wasn't too bad because, again, there's not much humidity in January. But uh, given the choice, I'd much rather have a traditional balcony. for It just feels better, if you will. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll, we'll uh, start to bring it to a close here. What was, the, what was your favorite meal on your week at Icon of the Seas? Empire Supper Club. I did not think it was going to be, Tony. Uh, I'm not really big on, like, frou-frou food or, like, big, ornate kind of meals. But I was blown away by this. It was uh, it's two hundred dollars per person. It's not cheap, but the com- but by offering cocktails, entertainment, and some really good food, I was really impressed by it. Much more than I ever thought I was going to be. I- anything disappoint you about the icon? Well, the as I mentioned, the the infinite um, verandas were a little disappointing there. Also, I think they tried to squeeze too much into the suites area. Um, Coastal Kitchen is the name of the suites only restaurant that you get if you're staying in a gray suite or above. And the Sweet Lounge is, of course, the Sweet Lounge. Um, on Icon, they are shoved together. It's like 66% Coastal Kitchen, third Sweet Lounge. And in some cases, like, the division of that is very thin. I think that was like a, uh, we run out of room here. We're going to make this work and we're going to shove both these things in here together to make it work. I wish, they had more. I think they need more real estate for that. In the same way that on an Oasis class ship, there is enough real estate to have on the same area, same deck, Coastal Kitchen and the Sweet Lounge. So that was also one of the disappointments for me. We didn't we didn't talk casino, but I know that uh, you like to play blackjack every once in a while. What was the casino like? Uh, was, was it all non smoking, smoking, non smoking, like the Wonder, or what's what's the setup there? It's smoking, non-smoking. The biggest difference, Tony, is on the non-smoking side, they added fans on the floor and the ceiling, and it really did move it well. Um, when I was on the smoking side, I knew I was on the smoking side, and on the non-smoking side, it worked a lot better. Uh, I have I have become a convert to the craps table, my friend, uh, thanks oh. to you. So uh, the, the dice were not, were not that kind to me, but I can tell you that I enjoyed my time over there, except for losing my money, um, with, in, in regards to the smoke. Um, it feels so much bigger. It felt like a land casino. The, the way they stretched it out um, was really impressive. I, I, I think you're going to like that quite a bit. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait to check it out. Well, Matt, there's uh, so much more that we could talk about, but I sure do appreciate you coming on, and I, I appreciate everything that you do. You definitely are a leader in the space, and you. Um, you, you are the go-to person when it comes to uh, all things unofficially Royal Caribbean, but I feel like you're my official source anyways. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for spending the time and having the conversation. It's always a pleasure. And then, of course, uh, I would encourage everybody to go check out Matt at his YouTube channel and at his blog, Royal Caribbean. Blog.com or Royal Caribbean Blog on YouTube. Uh, Matt, thanks a lot. Tony, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, there you go. A fantastic conversation with Matt from Royal Caribbean Blog. Uh, are you enjoying these video podcasts? Would you like to get it in audio form? This is available anywhere that you get your podcast. I'd love to hear your feedback. Please use the comment section below. Let me know what you think about the pod or if you want to suggest other guests to have on. Uh, just any kind of feedback you want to give, that would be great. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Please make sure that you're subscribed. Hit that like button on your way out. This is Tony for La Lita Loca. And until the next time, we'll see you on the Lido. Bye.